everyone to the Float Track Podcast. I'm Kevin Sully. He is Gordon Mack. Follow the show on YouTube. Subscribe, Float Track Podcast. Also, email us, Float Track Podcast at gmail.com. Got a busy show for you today, this Monday. Talk about Elaine Thompson Raw, Noah Lyles, Great Britain losing their silver medal. We'll preview the true indoor. Talk about high schooler Colin Salmon running a fast 3200. Keely Hodgkinson, Mondo, Grant Holloway, fast NCAA times. It goes on and on and on and on. Gordon, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Doing great. Another week of February in the books. <laughs> Coming up to the final week of February, I guess, technically. No, it's just a week mm-hmm. and a half of February left. I don't know. I'm in a good mood. I'm in a good mood. I'm ready for uh, this podcast. And I'm ready to talk about our sponsor, Hoka. Look mm-hmm. at these shoes. They've been there they are. sitting here right next to my face these past like 12 episodes. <laughs> so we should talk about them. Yeah. That, you're holding up this Cielo X, Jordan, which Hoka has just introduced. Most advanced spike shoe yet. You got the Cielo MD. I got the Cielo LD over here. The website again, Hoka.com. Hoka. Faster forward, and and we brought them to North Carolina. I'm going on another trip next week, and I'm gonna be bringing along my Cielo again. So my Cielo is gonna get to see a completely different state next week, and uh, you'll have to stay tuned to see where I end up with the shoe. I'm, I'm excited about it. I mean, it's a state I've never been to, so me and the Cielo are gonna see this shoe for this for the first time together. It's a bonding experience. Kevin, your your shoe is not uh. A living thing it cannot have it doesn't have feelings it doesn't have the ability to understand its location <laughs> so yeah i'm still bringing it okay Can't take that away from me <laughs> it's your um, teddy bear it's your new teddy bear the shoe yeah exactly exactly it uh keeps me warm so let's uh let's dive right in shall we um let's do it yeah we got about a month left of indoors because World indoors uh, are, are the end of March, so this is it. Little little over thirty ish days to go on the on the indoor season, and we targeted this weekend as a big one because some people were going to be chasing fast times, some people were going to be in some interesting head to head matchups, and we had some people debut. Let's start first with Elaine Thompson Harab. You know, I called the world record, Gordon. I'm not going to shy away from my prediction because I know you're going to go back to your board there and say, Kevin, didn't you predict a world record? I did. You were a little more conservative. You ended up being right. She goes 708 in her debut indoors. She ran a 60 outdoors, but wins it in Birmingham. She's going to race again in Tarun on Tuesday. So we'll see if your prediction of she's going to need a race under her belt to get going. When I watched this race, it made me think about what makes Thompson Hurrah special, at least as it pertained to last year. And it was really the second half of her races. If you remember the Olympic. 100 and prefontaine second half is where she really got going now she's run under seven seconds before so she's definitely capable of going faster but i think thompson hurrah even though she is a good starter um a little bit better as the race gets going and you could see that here for a while looks like she was trailing this race gordon um and then pulls it out in the very end i expect her to be better um in faster in this next meet but World record seems a little bit tougher now. Yeah, that wasn't the result of a, I'm running the world record next. Like, that didn't have the world records on deck feeling. Now, maybe there, we know she knows something we don't know. Maybe she had something in the reserves and she was working on just a small aspect of her race. And that once she puts together everything, it's going to be much, much faster. Yeah. But, yeah, she, it, it looked it did not look like a win from a 10 5 runner you know it did not look like that it looked like she was it looked very neck and neck with the rest of the field and it sounded like she was racing all time greats in that race yeah. so i was a little surprised how close the victory was especially mm-hmm. how much she was behind with just a few meters to go she had to you know close it out pretty hard and i mean she's only run the fourth fastest time this year right yeah she's still behind uh the polish athlete 
Swoboda, mm-hmm. Blue Band 7 flat, St. Price, the American, 704, Frisco, 707, and then Thompson Hurrah, 708. Now, I think we're going to get something a little bit better from her in Turin, Turin in what, tomorrow, yeah. I guess? That's what that means? Tomorrow, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe she gets a little bit on the other side of 705, I predict she'll probably do, but it didn't. Yeah. It wasn't what I thought it would be. I was kind of surprised. I thought it would be a little more dominating. So here's the thing with indoor season. You don't have much time. Because if this was outdoor, you'd say, who cares? It's a race yeah. in April. Throw it away. doesn't have anything to do with what they're going to run in July or August. Yeah. But indoor season, as I mentioned, is over in a month. And Holloway comes out hot, stays hot, right? Ingebrigtsen comes out hot. Keely Hodgkinson comes out hot. Like, you don't really have time to get acclimated. Now, she can be better for sure. And I'm not saying there's no chance she gets a world record. I'm not going to go from predicting 691 to saying there's no no chance that she can get it. I just think you're right. This looked like someone who's not to that stage yet of their season, which is fine. And maybe it's even better for her development outdoors um, because you just don't have that many opportunities. So if you're going to run low six nines, you'd think, okay, I'm going to open with a low seven or a high six and then work down from there with the limited opportunities that, that I do have this, I mean, I'm, you're right. Unless there's some sort of aspect of a race that she was working on that we're not able to see um, or some glaring error that she's going to able, able to fix easily. It's going to be tough for her to get sub seven. Don't know if we're going to see her at world indoors. And if we don't see her at world indoors, well then the opportunities to race are even fewer. Yeah. Do we know for sure if, if that's, uh, she made a decision if she's running world indoors? Do we know that? I haven't seen anything yet. If someone in the chat has seen something, let us know. I haven't I haven't seen anything yet. I mean, they talked in the broadcast about how sparingly she runs indoors, which is which is true, but she's also I mean, she competed at the last World Indoor Championships. Now, that was post an Olympic title. This was post an Olympic title as well, too. So it's not as if you could say, Hey, the only reason she ran last time was she wasn't as big a deal. No, she's the Olympic champion as well then. So who knows? Who knows if she'll do it? Again, picking whether or not people are going to run indoor championships is just basically guessing. But I think if she does that, then that'll give her a couple more opportunities, get a little bit sharper. But yeah, so much of her race is on that back half. And I know every race has a second half because that's just how mathematics works. But 60, it feels like it's not true. 60 is the one thing that makes, it's only at first. Feels like, yeah, it only it feels like fractions don't matter in the 60. There's no second half to a 60 meter race. That is very true. That should be a t-shirt. There's no second half to a 60. <laughs> yeah. Cause before they get to the second half, the, the, the race is already over. And you're like, wait, they hit the wall. And they're like, wait, second half hasn't started. So yeah, yeah. but we'll see. We'll get to see her again tomorrow, literally. So this yeah. may just, we'll find out. What I'm doing is very risky. I went from bold prediction one way to bold prediction the other way. And I'm just going to end up looking very silly. So that's okay. That's the position I put myself in. That's, you, you live by the board, you die by Gordon's board. That's just the way it there works. <laughs> On the men's side, Noah Lyles, 655. What was our over-under for what it would take for us to be like pretty impressed? What, we won at 6, what, 53? Is that what we said? I, th- I think we negotiated to 53 because I think I said 54 and you said 52. Um, yeah, so – 655, which is good, but it doesn't get me to like, whoa, oh, Noah Lyles, real player in the 100 yet. Um, because that's what this whole indoor season is for, at least my perspective on Noah Lyles, is what type of Lyles are we going to get in the outdoor season, right? We know he's, yeah. he's established in the 200. We know he had kind of a season of great 100 running back in 2019, right, when he was running good in the 100. Um, and you're kind of looking for this 60 season for him to kind of show, hey, I can mix it up with Baker. I can mix it up with Coleman. I can mix it up with Bromels. Um, and he keeps on notch, ratch, ratcheting down his PB to 655. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, maybe he has one more in him. I mean, is he going to be doing World in? Is he doing uh, USAs? I'm not sure. He's run a lot of 60s already, and he's slowly got a little bit quicker. He's won 662 to open, then a 656, and now a 655. 
I think he probably could go a little quicker. He probably has like a list a 653 in him. Um, mm. But overall, I mean, he's got to take away from this indoor season if this was his final race. An A, right? Yeah. Especially based yeah. on his kind of wild swing of how he approached outdoors last year with kind of yeah. being like, what happened to Noah Lyles? This guy was the next bolt. And now he's losing to high, losing to high school kids. Uh, I'm not sure if he actually had lost but did he end up ever lose to knighton no i beat him at trials and then he was okay. bronze he was and close knighton to was losing to him fourth to... yeah but he's not any high school kid he's not like jimmy know, from the I football know. team that he lost to using, guy it guy as, to the using it as a talking point to show that he wasn't running 19-5 every time he stepped on the track that's all um yeah I mean, anyway, 650, 655 is solid. I, get, I mean, it puts yes. him in the, in the kind of like the middle of the pack in terms of guys this year, right? Like it's not it's not like he'd be a top five guy. However, it's all about how this sets up for outdoors and not even the exactly. 100, but just even the 200, being able to nail that first part of your race and the 200. I know I just said the 60 doesn't have a second half. I, Lyles is the counter argument to that because he comes on so strong in the second half of these races. And then if you look at his his 60 progression and when he ran really well in the 60 previous, right, in 2017, 2018, when he ran the 657, those were good good seasons for him. And then, he, you know, he didn't yeah. run it in that 19 year, so we don't have a comp when he went on to win in, in Doha. Um, but in uh, 2021, the Olympic year, he struggled with the short stuff. Now, he didn't run that much indoors, but even going outdoors, you know, getting under 10 was a struggle for him. Yeah. So I think when you run this fast in a 60, that 6.5 mid with the ability to close, that means right now he's, I think he's comfortably in sub 10 shape, which is ahead of where he was, you know, for much of the early part of 2021. I, I think it'd be fun to see him in world indoors. I, you know, obviously because it's Noah Lyles and he brings a lot of excitement to it, but I think he can make this team as well. Because Romel's not running. He just beat Baker. Cravant Charleston's looked pretty good. But other than that, I mean, you have Coleman up there um, at, you know, taking, taking a spot. But, I mean, he can make this team, basically. Is he in the – let me check if he's in the – He's not entered. Um, no, no, he's not running. Okay. But, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a hypothetical here. I'm just saying okay. – it would, be, it would be fun to see him because the way the season has worked out, it looks as if he could make the the team. Um, reigning indoor champions get a bye? Coleman get a bye or is it just world indoor tour champions get a bye? I think it's just world indoor cha tour champions. I can double check. Okay. Uh, it would be listed While you do that, my... I mean, you look at the you look at the marks and it's so it's six forty nine for Coleman then you have Rogers six you know fifty two fifty three fifty four fifty four fifty nine and then you get in the six sixes so yeah. you know fifty five is right there for him yeah you you probably could have made the team but clearly uh, Lyles was looking at this indoor season to get back to his normal self like he was in twenty nineteen and. Uh, like you said, it's an A season, and he's going to set himself up for running because hopefully consistent 19 fives in the, the 200, you know, mid summer, mm -hmm. which will be set him up well for outdoors. All right, let's take on the sprints. Different type of story here, though. Uh, Great Britain is going to lose their silver medal from the four by one from Tokyo due to a doping violation. We had heard that CJ Uja tested positive for Osterine and S23 at the Olympics. Um, so they've been stripped of that medal. Uja said, uh, well, he apologized and said he unknowingly consumed a contaminated substance. Um, obviously, the British team took this very hard. I saw a quote from Richard Kilty, or headline basically saying that he wouldn't forgive Uja for being reckless. So big, big, big shake up there in the in the four by one um, metal category. And 
one that we expected. I mean, you expect once you get the positive test that the metal is going to get stripped, but once it actually happens and people having to give back metals, it's a big, it's a big deal. Um, drops there, it says it drops their metal to 64, um, which is interesting because one fewer than they, they got in London 2012. So right at the same marker and then this dropped them uh, below that. So what do you think, Gordon? I mean, typically when these stories come out, it always kind of feels like old news, right? We, we knew this, we knew this back months ago, like actual in, in the summer. Um, and now it's just like official, official, official. That's just how these whole doping situations happen. You have to talk about it 12 months later and be like, okay, remember the thing we are new. Okay. It, it's real now. So, um, you gotta feel for the other three athletes, right? Um, yeah. You don't get many opportunities to win an Olympic medal in your career and everyone mm -hmm. you're going to be very appreciative of it. And for one to be gone, it kind of, it kind of sucks. So, um, oh, yeah. at the same time, 100%. you know, these, you know, people like Richard Kilty and Zarnell Hughes, like they still got to enjoy that moment. Now, obviously that moment has an asterisk to it, but like, yeah. So you still got, China... you still, you know, you still got to, live breathe olympic type of glory for that for that heartbeat you know in the in real time so mm -hmm. so china moves up uh canada and china move up so canada would would move up to second and then china would move up to third if you bump everybody's places up so you end up with a podium italy canada and china in the four by one not one that many people would have predicted so no us no jamaica and no Great Britain on that men's four by one podium. I mean, I do know <clears throat> when I saw this news back in the original time, I wanted to see if removing Great Britain from prelims would have gotten yeah. USA into the final and it, it wouldn't have. So I was like, ooh, this, this could have been like the argument USA could have. Be like, well, if Great Britain yeah. didn't cheat, we would have made the final. You know, but no. Yeah. USA still, even removing this team that cheated, they still don't make the final. I feel like if you can't get top three in a heat with China, Canada, Italy, Germany, Ghana, you should not be able to move to the final. <clears throat> that's just my thought on it. Good Listen, thought. the thing that's unfortunate about it too is that this gets lumped together as team as if all these guys are working out together every single oh, yeah. Yeah. day of the year. So when you see a statement like Kilty statement, you kind of understand. It's like, nah, it's just like a bunch of people coming together for the relay camp and then the actual – me so they don't have any control really over their teammates and what their teammates choose to do and when you do that you're obviously putting yourself at huge risk but this is the impact it can have on the other people out there too because now their medal is taken away and you talked about them having a moment i mean what are the odds that they're going to get back in this position again it's hard enough to make your country's four by one team but then to medal in an event as unpredictable as that i mean they've had trouble getting the baton around just like the u.s has for years and then they finally get it right and then something like this happens it's tough it's tough pill to swallow for for great britain um don't blame don't blame people for being mad at him um i don't know if we have the his ban yet right just that they're stripping the metal we don't know how long he's of course not we need another 13 months another to figure six months. out yeah. simple situations. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I swear, are so doping, yeah. like, arbitration of sports and doping yeah. protocol people and uh, AIUs, what are they doing all day? Because it takes them so long to, like, do <laughs> obvious things. I don't understand why it takes so long for doping cases to become finalized. Like, it becomes a legal thing, and then you got to give time to appeal. You got to give due process. But hey, when at least when it comes to CAS, they sped things up when they needed to for the Winter Olympics. Now they sped things up in the wrong direction, I think. But they sped things up. They got that emergency hearing. They banged that one out in the evening. Yeah, hey, it's it's just tough because you want to give people time to respond, but then it stretches into the next competition, and then you have the problem. Well, okay, now this could taint the next competition. And so on and so forth. So it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it takes a long time. I mean, I think we can assume, you know, the big story is the medal's gone. He's going to serve some sort of suspension. 
Um, I mean, they were relatively quick on Okabare, weren't they? I mean, I know that's going to go to appeal, but that was late July. I know that, that, I mean, I guess it's fast in their time that it's, what, seven, eight months later. But to get to a 10-year ban, they moved pretty relatively quickly. I guess they were giving her time to, to figure out, like, what she was going to, what she was going to say. Um, like so there said, you go. It's fast in their time, seven or eight months. Yeah. Well, seven, yeah. eight months fast in any, in any time. Like, come on. Yeah, well, yeah, it's I mean, everybody. Baby, it's really quick. It's just about seven or eight months. You know, you're done. It's really quick you, it's actually, before you even know it. Well, it's longer than that, actually. We're talking okay, about from sorry. the beginning to the whole thing. Yeah. There's, see, there's three trimesters, Gordon. That's how it was. Okay, I know. Okay. okay. Okay, thanks. World Indoor Tour continues. Tarun, as we mentioned it before, it's going to be on Tuesday. You got Elaine Thompson around the 60. You have another fast 3,000. And I'm serious this time when I say it's a really fast 3,000. Wale, Borrega, and Gurma. Uh, Sagai's in the 15. Femke Bowl is in the quarter. What are you most excited to see, Gordon? I mean, Elaine Thompson, hurrah again, right? Obviously, I'm excited to see if my prediction of she just needed a rust buster in first race to kind of come back and run a, an incredible 60. Um, yeah. And then I'm excited for the men's 3K. Uh, I think that's going to be quick. Femke Bowl in the yeah. 400 should be fun. Obviously, 400, though, indoors, it's hit or miss, right? Because it's hard to get someone to run really quick around. The track two times uh but i really think if we scroll to the men's 3k that would be the, mm -hmm. the one event that i'm most looking forward to because you have the ethiopian trio mm -hmm. this is i was actually thinking about this if you're ethiopia you only get two guys right yeah mm -hmm. and they have four that can run an incredible 3k how do they well, decide they got... They got more than that. Yeah, it's tough. I think they're just going to probably go on. I mean, they're just doing straight selection, right? So I think that's what part of this is. They're just they're trying to get selected by their federation because USA's are this week. So, you, you know, the cutoff is after this week to put entries in. So this is the last chance to impress them. The time got all – they thought it was going to be a record attempt, you know, last week in Leven, and that was one of the only ones that was slow. I guess the women's – Mile was slow with Sagai, but that was in large part because the star of the show fell and then she caught everybody in one, which is impressive. But yeah, they gotta they gotta stick on early. They they can't let this pace pace drift. I mean it was still a fun race to watch, but you're going for that world record. There's just like no margin for error um indoors, it seems like. And that's a that's a tough record. Indoors are out, that's a tough record. Coleman's mark is really, really good. So yeah, I, I think this is going to play a large part in who they ultimately select for World Because Indoors. you already have Aragawe, who's run 7.24, or yep. no, excuse me, 7.26 this year. And then you have these three <clears throat> guys, Borrega, Gurma, and Wa Whale. Wally? Whale? Wale. Wale. Apologies. They've all run 7.30 this year. You're yeah. just like, they only can, and you only get two. It's not three. So I'm yeah. guessing... This is basically the de facto who gets a second spot behind Aragawe. Yes, that's that's how I'm reading it. Um, unless we have a buy situation from last year, don't remember who took home the World Indoor Tour three thousand yeah. <laughs> title buy. last year. But look at that! Look at that list! Look at that list! You got McCall up there. You got Katir. So you got two from Spain. Kenya continues to struggle um, in the three and the five. And we see that indoors. You got Sweden's Almgren up there. You have Baylor. I mean, this is uh, this is shaping up well for for Ethiopia, and I think this this is a. I, I'm interested to see who the U.S. will send in this event, right? They got Hawker, um, entered, but Emmanuel Bohr is entered in the. U.S. 3K, but this is going to be a uh, this is going to be an interesting race because you don't see the the types of uh, depth across the board. I think that you normally would like that's a surprising top ten <laughs> to see some of those names in the top ten is it's it's very shocking. But that's Tarun World Indoor Tour coming up on Tuesday. Um, let's go to the high school ranks. We're going to loop back to the pros in a second, but high school whoops boys. 
3200 Sundown Track Series number two, Colin Salmon, last seen smashing the four minute barrier in New York, now runs 833 for 3200. Gordon, where does that match up all time? Because there's some two mile marks, there's some 3K marks, there's some 3200 marks. Where does this sit for you? All time. So if you include uh, two mile conversions, so only including two miles, not three Ks, it's the fourth yeah. fastest 3200 ever. So Lucas Verspikis ran a two mile that converted to 826 for 3200. German Fernandez ran 831 in 2008. Jeff Nelson, 19, in 1979, ran 833. And now Colin Solomon, number four all time with his 833. Three seconds faster than Hobbs Kessler last year. Three seconds faster than Ed Cheserak in 2013. Three seconds faster than Lindgren. You know, five seconds faster than Centro. And Leo Young, who was in this race, who ran 839, is now 11th all time. So okay. number four and number 11 all time in the 3,200 meter ranks in this one race from the senior and the junior. And there's a lot of, you know... Number 12 all time is Nico Young, which is interesting. So now three of the top 12 are from Newberry Park yeah. in the past two years. It is incredible. And when you also look at, you can think about, is it the shoes? Three of the past 12 are from Newberry Park, but five of the past 12 are from 2020 to 2022. Because you throw in Hobbs Kessler from last yeah. year and Nathan Mountain, who in who low key in 2021 ran 8:39. So, uh, but 8:33, you're up there in the. You're getting closer to the German Fernandez, Lucas Verspikis category, which, as we know, yeah. those were all time high school greats. Um, and Colin Solomon doing this. They ran those times in like June, like at the end of their seasons when they're yeah. peaking at the peak of all their peaks. Colin Solomon is still like building up so i have to imagine when it's all said and done you know four months from now he should be yeah. running in the 820s for 3200. he closed in 59 so i think he's sharp now but i'm fascinated by how their season is going it's almost oriented like a college season i mean their cross-country season went late california goes late as is but then they ran running lane and then now they're running just super fast indoors almost as in the same way a college team would be to try to qualify for NCAAs. I mean, in their indoor season, they're running these outdoor meets, but they're running during the indoor season because California traditionally didn't have much going on during these months because not a lot of indoor facilities and not a lot of desire to run indoors. Indoor track isn't sponsored there. So this is, this is new. And I'm curious to see how it works. These guys, obviously we've said all we can really say about how on another level this whole group is, but yeah, I wonder what the racing schedule is going to be like for the coming months. To be, uh, to be quite honest, because I don't know, like, how do how do you keep this going? What is the actual peak? Is the peak some for some all star meet in in June? Is it for the state meet? Is it something earlier than that? Because eight thirty three, you're raring to go right now. I mean, it's if it, this isn't him fully ready to roll, I, it's scary what he's going to be able to do when he's when he's rested and ready. Well, you know, now I'm sure they're not even thinking state meet anymore or even, you know, New Balance Nas Nationals, Brooks PR type races anymore. Now I'm thinking they should start considering, hey, let's try to chase U.S. championship standards. Let's try to potentially even chase a world standard if they could get there. It's kind of crazy to think they could get a world standard. But um, yeah, I think... They may be setting their set their eyes on trying to qualify for USA's. Now I'm not. They're not definitely not in the the world to make a world team this year. But if they can make USA's and just have that experience as a true high school kid and mm -hmm. uh, run with the pros, that'd be pretty cool. I think there is World Juniors this year. So is there, is there World Juniors? I don't know if there's World Juniors. Twenty twenty two World. There's USA well, Juniors. So maybe. Maybe they, they go for USA Juniors, but they're now probably thinking, let's try to get a qualifier mark for USA's, you know, in, whether it's in yeah. the 15 or the 5K, which I'm sure is what There are, yeah, there's U20s this year. Yeah, there's U20s in Columbia. 
Um, what's the record for most high schoolers from one team qualifying for a U.S. championship? I'm just kidding. I'm sure the record is one, and they'll break it because they'll do more than one. Uh, just kidding. Apparently, in the mile split interview, uh, Salman said they could have gone faster, but the pacer was slow. You know, because <laughs> all right, all right, all right. The pacer threw Easy on miles the pacer. slow. Oh, I guess. Oh, Lyle's brothers. Those two yeah. from one high school. So <laughs> they'll break it with three because right. they'll have the 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 Youngs and uh, Sol- the Salmons and the Youngs. So they could probably get four in. Since, yeah. Do this whole yeah, thing. I don't want to. I just like it doesn't seem real. I know everyone's like it feels it's like. It's it's becoming comical how quick they are like these type mm. of performances should be once in a decade type runs and they're doing it. Yeah. Week in, week out, all on the same team. And it's like, how is this possible? And I just want to know, is this going to be repeatable? Like, is there going to be someone three years from now, four years from now, where there'll be a group of kids from, th- from the same school who are running like these top 10 type marks? Because you do know a factor is the shoes. Like, shoes is a reason why kids are able to run faster, but they're running faster than beyond the shoes because. You know, you don't yeah, give, relative to the competition, they're faster. Yeah, relative to the competition, he's still running eight thirty three, and everyone else is running, you know, yeah, eight fifties. Yeah. So, um, I just want to know if if this is something we'll never see again, or is this something that is going to become a, a new trend every four years? We have another group of a class of kids who are like, we're At running this school out or of any, our minds. any school from a school from a specific school. Yeah. Well, it's a little different because, you know, college, you can recruit, right? So yeah. you can accumulate talent a lot easier. High school, I mean, I know every state has their different regulations, but it's it's harder to pull that much talent together in one place at the same time. We've seen dynasties in high school before, and obviously sometimes in, in those situations, parents are willing to like relocate to put their kids in a school where – there's other good runners or the program is solid, but usually that's fleeting that lasts for a couple of years and then it goes to a different place. And then it goes, you know, because at a certain point, the amount of commitment is just, um, there's a shelf life to it, right. Of of the amount of people that can, can stay in one spot. So with high school, with college, you can see some, you know, see stuff like this going on forever, but high school is just totally, totally different. And they're also setting a bar now that they themselves would have to clear. So if in four years, Newberry Park has a bunch of guys run 858, well, every other year we'd say that's nuts. And they'd be like, well, that's like way off of the 2022 Newberry team. Like what, yeah. what, what's, what, what's the big deal? So they're, they're going to be their own uh, competition moving forward. But I think this is unique. You convinced me a couple – weeks ago that this is this is unique this isn't the new normal and the reason i say that is just because you take the shoes out of it you take the amount of all-star meets out of it that are available that didn't used to be there and it's how are they doing relative to the rest of the country and when you're when you're telling me that the salmons plus the youngs are in the top five in the nation well that's that doesn't have anything to do with different technology they all have the technology right and they and most of them have access to all these meets and they're just better than them so the question you got to say is will there ever be a time when all of the best runners in the country are on one team again and i think that's going to be low probability because running is an individual sport and although it's fun to have people to train with and run with i think it's an easier sell to get people to together on in, in a team sport hey you're going to be showcased more we're going to win more games your games are going to be on tv if you go to this program or that program yeah like running because it's inevitable yeah yeah, okay, yeah. running see. you can you can chart your own path with running you can do it your own way and you get you get fast enough people are going to notice you it doesn't matter where you are now maybe the program has just evolved to a point where everybody is going to be like Maybe I'm underestimating it and all everybody in that attendance zone is just going to crush it and they're going to have be a bunch of sub four milers growing up in uh, in Southern California in the Newberry Park zone and they're not going to need to, to uh, like it's all going to be right there for them. But I just think in the future, um, this is special. 
It's special. It's, it, I don't think it's going to be replicated like this. Yeah. No. It, it makes. Uh, I hope it is something. I mean, you want it. You want. You don't want this to become a new trend because then it diminishes what they're doing it. But then you also do want it to become a trend because it's fun to see high school kids run great times and you know compare themselves yeah. to all time, you know, greatness. So. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Uh, other highlights. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Let's see. What else do we got? Uh, Keely Hodgkinson, 157 in her 800 debut. This was impressive. This was in uh, in Birmingham, the penultimate, or sorry, the old last event, I guess, before Mondo. Mondo kept going. Mondo had his own showcase, but she just blew the doors off of everybody. Gordon, only five women in history have run faster. She set the British record. I mean, this was a serious time. So if you thought the 155 that she ran last year was just her just hanging on for dear life to a thing Mo, she's just as good this year. She's right, she's right there. And I don't know if this is going to develop into a rivalry because I think Mo has another level to go up as well too. But this is certainly a fun development if you're into the women's 800. I mean, this is this is exactly what you want. You want someone to to be able to push a thing, Mo, who's just yeah. the same age as her, too. Yeah, that's the bigger part. Is that they're literally both teen? She the, is she a teenager still? Is she twenty right, now. Twenty, right? Just in twenty. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we got. I mean, RJ Wilson came onto the scene. What? I'm oh, no, sorry. 20, she's she's nine. She's nineteen 19 for another still? two weeks. T- two more weeks. Two weeks. Or a week now. Yeah. Audrey Wilson came on a scene, what, in 2013-ish? 12, 13? Mm-hmm. And she's still relevant pretty much a decade later. So we're going to have a decade of Keeley and the thing. It's just like, it's incredible for that event. Yeah, and we don't know much of where, I mean, Mo ran that mile at Texas A&M, then turned the mile at Milrose, where she went out with the leaders and then fell back and then ultimately DNF'd. Um, the reason why I think she's got more is just anybody who watched those races. I mean, you're front running and winning a gold medal and setting PRs. It's just like, all right, if you got into a, you got with a rabbit, um, perhaps you go even faster or just, you know, a couple more races under your belt, a little more experience with that 400 meter speed. She can just get to a level of speed that nobody can match in the, in the 800, but yeah, she's a little bit younger than Hodgkinson. Mo turns 20 in June, and wow. we could be talk. We could be talking about this for the next couple Olympic cycles, or at least the next one for sure. Um, I don't. Did you when you watch the Olympics? Did you think okay, this is going to be Mo and Hodgkinson's decade, or did you think this is Mo's race and Hodgkinson is just kind of in the background. Yeah, I thought like, oh, she's Hodgkin, she's just going along for the ride. She's having like an yeah. incredible lifetime achievement type performance that will never get replicated it's just because of the, the heat of the moment. But then when you come back and you run a 157 indoor right away, yeah, it's like, no, that wasn't. That was potentially the start of something, something like lasting, you know. Because yeah. some people have, you know, one time only races. That'll be actually be an interesting thing to find, like look at, like greatest one time stars, mm-hmm. where they just one had race, one, one race, race, and everyone's like, "What the hell?" And then we never mm-hmm. heard from them again, or maybe even one season. You could say I can think of a mm-hmm. few who had like one season, and then you never heard from them again. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm excited. It should be good, and um, it's the return of the Revolutionary War, right? America <laughs> versus Great Britain. Who's gonna win? Taxation without representation. <laughs> when I watched the Olympic race, I'm gonna let that one go. I thought about because there were some parallels that people are making to Rhodesia 2012, the way Mo just front ran it, and if a thing Mo was Rhodesia, then Keely Hodgkinson was Nigel Amos, who ran 
141 as well in that race. And that's been his high point in terms of medals, right? Like that, that silver medal was the best he ever did in a major competition. So that's sort of what I thought, okay, I think most people attribute all those PRs in that race to Radisha. Radisha made that race. He served as the rabbit. He got everything going and then everyone followed. Now, you know, they had to actually run the race themselves, but a lot of it was um, him getting out there and making sure it was honest and stringing things out. So that's why I thought with Mo, it's like, hey, are all the, are the fast times that come behind her, are they Mo dependent? Um, because sometimes that happens. You get a perfect night and you get the perfect situation and you get the perfect person to set a hard pace. And then that's that. I mean, and Amos, I mean, hasn't run that fast ever again. That was the fastest point. But I think Hodgkinson going 157 low indoors means that she's going to be able to at least match the 155 that she did. And I'm excited to see them race when they, whenever they do race again, which I hope is early and often because to have two stars this young going at it for potentially the next several years, I mean, that's just really exciting. And I don't think it's something that we counted on two, three years ago. I mean, people had heard of Keely Hodgkinson in the track world. I mean, the larger track world, I'm sure in Great Britain for a while they had heard of her, but she really came onto the scene the last couple of years. Same thing with the thing Mo, and people knew how good she was in AAU, but it wasn't until she got to Texas A&M that the wider track world was like, oh, okay, she's able to make, she made the jump. She went from yeah. like low twos now into smashing two minutes and running these crazy 400s. And you just, just see who she beat. So there was no guarantee that either of them would, you know, translate into solid um, runners on the pro circuit because there's just no guarantee anybody's going to. And the fact that they both did it is, is remarkable and doing it at the same time. So I'm super excited to see it happen. Uh, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. What a, oh, uh, Gray Holloway, you won again, 741. I thought that was great. And then Mondo, Mondo doing, I did a thing on both those guys for this week in track, which is going up today. People can check it out. But I thought Holloway's like Birmingham performance was almost better than his uh, Lee Van, even though he was slower, just because he like hurtled across the finish line. Just, it's just so easy for him right now. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I feel like any track meet, that has Mondo, any indoor track meet that has Mondo and Holloway, you're guaranteed a Holloway win and a Mondo world record attempt. Like it's just, it comes yeah. with the yep. package. It's all, <laughs> it's all included. You get, hey, you get Mondo, you get three world record attempts. You get in Holloway, you get an easy win. Um, and that's what we've been getting all year round with these two guys is Holloway getting the win and Mondo going oh so close to yet another personal best slash world record. Um, yeah. All right. It's kind of wild Simon. how just consistent they are at their greatness. It's kind of wild. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, Gordon's going to talk about college now and how fast it is. Cole, I think you go full box Gordon here just what? for the no, next what? 10 minutes. No, I don't need a full box. <laughs> just put up, put up some – you want him to put up some stats, Gordon? What do you need for this presentation? Yeah, bring up the T-first thing. Uh, wow. So this past cool. this past weekend T-first. was a big distance medley relay weekend. And I'm going to preface this weekend with a certain – we talked about the DMR a month ago. And a certain coach, Dave Smith, I'll just say his name, uh, ran the <laughs> NCAA leading mark of 928. He ran 928, uh, NCAA leading mark, and we talked about – is that fast enough to qualify? And we both were like, I don't think it will be. Like, it's a weird year. You got the shoes, you know, people are running fast. Typically, 928 would be fast enough to get you in, but I don't think it's going to be top 12. He listened to that podcast. He texted me after saying we were crazy to not think 928 would be top 12. Turns out we weren't that crazy because – it ter- turns out you need to run 9.24, a whole four seconds faster to qualify this year. Oklahoma State being one of those teams that ran in Arkansas, they ran in 9.22 range. But you have multiple teams running 9.21s, 9.22s. It took 9.24 to qualify when all is said and done. It's an insane. 
So for perspective, in 2008, I believe the national record was set at 924 by Texas. And that had the Leo Manzano team, Jacob Hernandez. It was an all-time great team. Now the, the former collegiate record, which was broken a year, I think by Oregon broke it. Maybe one other team broke it. But like a collegiate record that stood for like a decade in 2008 now would not be fast enough to qualify in 2022. That's crazy. Literally, all 12 teams that are going to NCAAs ran faster than a record that stood for like eight years from 2008. Um, so the DMR has just been out of this world. Um, the main players are in there. Notre Dame, obviously, with Nagus. Ole Miss is there with Mario Garcia Romo. And then, you know, everyone and their mom just is able to find a 353, 1600 meter runner to put on an anchor to run in the 920s. It's, in, it's incredible. Uh, on the women's side, you know, you needed like 11, you needed a sub 11, which is also an all time fastest mark for women. Um, but yeah, DMR is going to be interesting. And it's going to be, uh, there's one more weekend to qualify. There may be a team or two that try to time trial their way into the top 12. I could think NAU at their conference meet um, could maybe do it. Big East has Georgetown and Villanova. Georgetown fell at JDL, so they might try one more time against Villanova. But it's just incredible how fast DMRs are. I mean, Kevin, what's your thoughts on the DMR just being bonkers fast? Like, this isn't normal. I'm glad you asked that, Gordon. Here are my thoughts. One, obviously, we talked about all the other performances being fast. 3K, mile, et cetera, et cetera. I think you're going to see a bigger impact, though, in the DMR. Why? Because everybody's running what they have to to qualify. And that race itself basically is just one big game of follow the leader. So if someone gets out there and goes quick, everybody's going to go with. And the coaches know. They put themselves in these races with other top teams. And they say, hey, just stick with Washington. Hey, just stick with Ole Miss. Hey, just stick with Oklahoma State. And you'll be fine. So, yeah, I think some of it is the technological improvements. But I also think it's just a case of people meeting the standard within a relay where you really don't have any other incentive um, to like lead early on in that mile leg other than just to, to to chase that fast time, right? You get what I'm saying? Like it's not a four by four where you're just doing it in isolation and you go from the gun. Like you need those other teams with you. So when you have this collaborative effort of everybody pushing it a little bit more, I'm not surprised that we got to where we are. Yeah. I think it's just wild. I mean, the records were <clears throat> Texas's time was considered like a, a, a strong NCA record yeah. for the DMR. And now in 2022, yeah. you needed to run that time to qualify. It's, it's insane. Wow. Yeah, but here's here's my counter to that. How many times, you know, over the past decade, decade plus, have we seen just honest, straight from the gun, full out record attempts? Or how many times have we seen at NCAA championships where you have all the best teams together, but the race doesn't go fast? I mean, I yeah, remember Von yeah. Tech really pushed it that really pushed it that year with um with Ben Thomas and that group that he had there. They like went for it from the gun and ran a fast time. But there's a lot of times when people are looking around and they're running strategically, which makes sense because they're racing to win. Um, this year it just so happened that nobody felt safe. And then once someone makes that first move, everybody's responding. Everybody both in the race itself and on the descending order list it sort of mirrored itself there, right? One person goes and then everyone's like, all right, we all got to go. We all got to cover this. We all got to enter one more meet where in the years past, they wouldn't enter one more week or we all got to cover this move um, that the mile leg is, is doing in this first lap or nearly we might let them go, but they're going out too fast, but hell like 353 people can run 353 now. So I better go cover that. So I just think we're seeing some symmetry here between how the race is run itself and how um, people are chasing qualification marks to, to NCAA indoors. That makes sense. I, I just know. thought something hilarious. I'm going to no, go to Colton it. So, didn't judge that. A mat, uh, in, there used to be, the way you qualify for NCAAs like a decade ago 
there was an A standard and a provisional standard, right? There was an auto standard. So if you just, yeah. it wasn't top 16 or top 12 and you're in, it was just like, if you break this, you're in, and then they'll fill the fields. The yep. auto standard for the DMR a decade ago used to be 930. So yeah, 930 was the standard. So let's look at how many people have broken 930 this year, how many teams. 15 would have qualified. Now, this is maybe a bad example, but my point, my point being, I think well, they was changed. That hilarious? I think, no, there wasn't that. There wasn't as hilarious. Okay, stop it. Stop it. You know, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think crying, it got changed. Laying on the floor, like, laughing, crying, laying on stop the floor. Stop it. Stop it. It is funny. Okay. My point being. <laughs> There used to be a situation when there was an A. The A standard would change year to year. So I'm, maybe I'm picking the wrong yeah, yeah. year. 2010 I is a bad I, I year. I get what you're saying. What you're but saying. imagine if we had that system in 2022 yeah. where the A standard is based off of the previous years, whatever, the eighth best mark or whatever. Yeah. NCAA indoors would have like 40 people in every event. Okay, here we go. 9.32 was the standard in 2011. So 9.32 was the standard in 2011, and that was the standard this year. They would have had to let in 20 teams in the DMR. Can you imagine 20 DMR teams trying to race More like it. on the track at once? It would be insane. I love it. No, I love anyway, it. Anyway, I'm just saying it's a good thing we got rid of the A standards in indoor track because when the Super Shoes came in, yeah. You would have mile fields and 5K fields with like 30 people on an indoor track. So, yeah. We prevented so a disaster, the championship, that's what I'm trying to say. Let me ask you this the championship record is 919 from Oregon. And here are the splits from last year Hawker 252, 47 5, 146, and then Tier was 352 99. Do you think someone beats that? 100%. Yes, someone's running nine, nine, eighteen at least. Yeah, hundred percent. Why not? There, we have like fifth. We have we have twelve teams all running nine twenty four or faster. We have a bunch of nine twenty ones, and that was just for qualifying. You know, there everyone had a, a half a second in them to get faster. So, hundred percent. I think we're going to see at least a nine eighteen. It's not getting. I'm not ready slower. to put it. I'm not ready to put it up on the board, but I'm feeling like no. Because I think we're going to go back to people looking at each other again. Nah, nah, There's no incentive to run fast. Especially if, if Nagoose is there. No. So the, the Washington anchor, Faye? What, he split? Yeah. 253? He's pretty good. Uh, what, what did he split? Ryan Faye. I mean, his mile PB listed here is 355. Um, so the Washington anchor split... I can bring it up. 352. 352.81 was the split. Yeah. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in the chat, someone brought up the fact that they'll they'll bring in their 4x4 four four, or they're like a 400 stud to run it, and then it NCAAs, they may not use that person. I'm just seeing who, if anybody did that. Like Alabama ran a guy who's run 45.7 on their squad yeah but maybe they'll that's I mean, true texas but... used texas used a 46 one guy it's a lot of options some of those schools have a ton of quarter milers to to throw around i mean u-dubs guy was well he's not even a quarter miler 21 4 and 200 so and that leg just doesn't matter a ton when it comes down to it and it for qualifying i know because half a second here half yeah. a second there but for the for the title, it, it doesn't. So right now, Vatek is out by about a second. They're the first on the men's yeah. side. So, and then also there was know. a fast three k at Arkansas. I mentioned how it's crazy the men's three k that Wesley Kip to wasn't qualified. Well, now he is. Clearly, this was a race they they originally did not have on their schedule. I don't think the plan was for Wesley Kip to to run back to back three k's. But because of the ridiculousness yeah. of the 3K, he had to go out there. And he, he didn't win his race. He actually lost to uh, NAIA Zuhar Talbi, which we all yep. 
Lincoln Strike's favorite runner. Um, but Kip Two got third in that race. Amon Kemboy got second, ran 7.42. So now mm -hmm. the 16th fastest 3K time is 7.46, which is wild. 7.46. Alex Mayer mm -hmm. ran 7.46.61, and he is not qualified in the 3K. Only, what, two or three Newberry Park kids could do that, right? This year? Yeah. yeah. Only two or three. Um, it's a joke, And, guys. you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be faster, too, because Nico Young could probably time trial himself at Big Sky into the 3K. Yep. So I, there could be a situation where, like, 745 doesn't qualify. <laughs> it's just wild. It's yeah. just wild. So what's the – I mean, I'm trying to tease all this stuff out, right? The women's times are pretty consistent. I know you said the women's DMR is faster, but the women's times haven't been as deep. And then this, I mean, the 800 times, like what are the, how do the 800 times match up to years past? So for, for women to men, first of all, so the men's times, they are like the, the like 10 to six, like the back half of the top 16 are much, much faster, right? Because obviously like 16th fastest Relatively time for speaking, men yeah, yeah. is so much faster than previous years. For the women, it's not the 16th time that's much faster. It's like the yeah. 50th time. So like there's just a lot okay. more women in the like sub elite category who are running much faster. So for example, there's a lot of women who are breaking 440 uh, yeah. than ever before. But the number of women who are breaking 435 is similar, which is kind of interesting. So, like, what about men's eight? Men's eight right now, I mean, that's a little bit quicker, but it's still nothing too crazy because everyone's yeah. just running 147s. Um, okay. It's not that massive of a difference. Um, it's basically, it's quarter, same marginal. thing. Yeah. What's that? The quarter, the same thing. I'm just trying to because well, one of the reasons yeah, I gave was, is, oh, you got all these six, crazy. you got all these yeah. six year seniors. But like, if six year seniors were weighing this heavily on how fast the descending order lists were, no. then you'd see it in other events. You wouldn't just see this it in is, distance events. This is really just hitting the mile three k and five k. It's not really hitting yeah. the, the sprint events or even the eight hundred. And it's hitting the men more than it's hitting the women. Again, the men, That's, it's hitting okay. the. Back half of qualifiers, the women, it's hitting like the, the overall depth. So like people in the 50s to the 70s were, are just much faster than anyone else previously. So, yeah. so that's, which is I'm kind of interesting trying... how that's happening, why it's only hitting a certain right. segment, you know? Well, because if it was shoes, if it was shoes, but for the distance runners, you'd think it'd be the same as women for men. If it was 60 or seniors and the presence of older athletes, you'd think it would impact all the events or at least have an even dispersal. So I think post indoors, we need to do a six part investigative series where we figure out what's going on. Cause I don't know. I mean, I know it's a, I know it's complicated. It's a combination of factors, but that doesn't mean you can't start a six part investigative podcast. If you don't know the answers, that just makes the podcast better. I just, I'm curious now because I, I had one set of beliefs in my head, but then a lot of the information that we're looking at makes it more complicated. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, Bill asks, didn't Gordon do a prediction earlier on 800 meter mark to qualify? Seems like I recall him predicting 147.7. Well, if you did, Gordon, I got news for you because right now number 16 is what? 147 point. Where is it? Hold on. 147.79. So, I don't, Bill, to answer your question, I don't know if that was a prediction because if it was, Gordon would remember it and he'd remind me and all of you every single day. So I don't know what it was, but if someone could find it. Do you remember it, Gordon? Did you write it on the board? I don't remember it, but I but do was... remember trying to predict what the 16th time would be. I do remember doing someone that. Someone asked, yeah. yeah. Doing that. Oh, okay, someone uh, says 148 flat. Tariq says you said 148 flat. Okay. So yeah. You're off by two tenths right now. One. Not bad. Not yeah. bad. Yeah. Going into conference championship weekend. Things could change. Um, all right. So Wednesday, we'll recap. Tar we have just so much stuff to talk about. Wednesday, we'll recap Tarun, and then we'll have to preview some U USA stuff a little bit. And then Friday, we'll do even more of a preview on USAs and conference championships as well. 
So this is going to be a, a really big weekend in in track. So check out the Tarun meet. Do you have anything else, Gordon, you want to say? Yeah, live. Obviously, Tarun is tomorrow. Uh, but this weekend, Big East champs live on flow track. There's some Villanova, Georgetown, Providence action. And then the BU last chance invite is live on flow mm -hmm. on Sunday. Don't know who's going to be there, but uh, typically we get some quick races for people who want to dip their toes on that fast track one last time before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. We don't know who's going to be there, but we do know it's their last chance. We do. Yes. Facts. And then, the, and then the following Thanks. week. The following week, we have Madrid World Indoor Tour, the Paris World Indoor yeah. Tour, and the Tokyo Marathon. Kipchoge, live on flow. So. Oh, that's coming up soon. Yeah. He made that announcement. He made that announcement late now that I think about it. I guess they had to yep, with yep. all the restrictions yep. and going on. But yeah, March, March 6th is right here. February, short month. A lot of people don't know that. It's a, it's a hidden thing that they don't tell you. All right. Yeah. Hoka <laughs> is our sponsor. Thanks for sponsoring the show, Hoka. Uh, go to hoka.com. Check out the Cielo. X, MD, the LD, it's all there. Uh, thanks to Colt for producing. Thanks to Travis for producing. Thanks to all of you who tuned in live and contributed questions. We sure do appreciate it. it. Makes the show a lot more fun. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to the FlowTrack Podcast YouTube page. You can download the podcast wherever you get audio podcasts as well. He's Gordon. I'm Kevin. Have a great day.